opportunity to be here. Uh, not only the opportunity, but for the honor. I, I love to come to this country, and it's an incredible place. Today, I'm not talking so much about uh, technical solutions as I am technical threats. And uh, the thing is that the technical th surveillance threats have changed and evolved dramatically in the last 10 years. Ah, there. Uh, I am with Research Electronics International from uh, Cookville, Tennessee. We are a small company. I won't spend too much time on this, but we've been doing this for more than 30 years. And this is our primary business. We are the largest company in the world that, that specializes in this one technical area. The company Burkana is actually our partner here in Brazil. And uh, not only do they represent our products, but also other vendors and suppliers and technologies. And uh, I'll show you some threats. Obviously, I don't have solutions for all of these threats, but I would say Burkana does through other suppliers and other representatives. So first, I want to explain what is this type of security that we're talking about. Uh, my term for it is, is TSCM, Technical Surveillance Countermeasures. But just to give an idea exactly what we're talking about, it is a, a specialized area of security. We're not talking about, uh, well, we protect our buildings, we protect our people, we protect our automobiles, we protect all of our valuable assets. We may lock them, we may secure them, we may put cameras on them, we put documents in safes, we protect our computer networks. But the question is, how do we protect what we say and what we do? This is really where TSCM comes, comes into play. Uh, the problem is, well, one main point is the United States FBI views that espionage or spying is actually their number two threat. It's only number two to terrorism. Uh, it's above drugs, it's above threft, theft, uh, even natural disasters, it is espionage because it costs the country so much. This is another news report. This one's a little bit older. This is from 2015. But even five years ago, CNN reported that espionage cases were on the rise at a rate of a 53% increase. So let me back up just a moment. What we did as a company four years ago is we decided to just do a search to see how many stories we could find, and we picked one month to do it in. So in October of 2017, this is an example of what we found just, just in the news. And most of these are commercial cases, but it's really quite interesting. There are 14 stories here, everywhere from uh, baseball teams to a bakery to Airbnb surveillance. Uh, down here, this one is funny to me, even smoothie chain. I don't know why someone wants to spy on a smoothie chain, but it's an interesting example. This was in October of 2017. So then we decided to do this every year just to see how it changed. So in 2018, now the list grows. Here we had 23 stories. Uh, again, all kinds of different espionage. Again, most of this is commercial simply because government and law enforcement stories aren't published. So this is just what's available. Again, moving forward one more year, same type of search, same search parameters. We have 34 stories. And it grows and grows and grows to all kinds of commercial industries, all kinds of technologies, uh, affecting everything in our economy. So why does it grow? Uh, well, one other point. Again, these are just the stories that are in the news. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. And government, law enforcement, these stories are, are, are hidden, they're kept confidential, they're protected for the security of the country, for the security of the law enforcement. The other point is, very large stories of, an es in, of industrial espionage are also kept secret just to protect the company itself. But the bottom line is, incidents are increasing, and the reason is because technology is changing. I want to go back in history, 75 years, to give you an example, and then we'll jump ahead to some other stories just to see how technology has changed. This was 75 years ago in 1945, and this was uh, known as the Great Seal. This was a gift given to a U.S. ambassador to Russia. It was a gift given by the Russians. And for seven years, this device hung in the ambassador's home, and uh, they stole information and they, they could listen in to what's going on. 
The amazing thing about this device is that uh, it had no batteries and uh, it was completely passive. It worked on a resonant cavity approach. So they would radiate uh, uh, RF waveform into the, into the facility. The energy would excite this resonant cavity and there was a mylar uh, film here that would, would modulate the audio and re-radiate. The actual truth is the US didn't find this device. It was the British embassy, embassy next door where a radio operator was scanning frequencies and he discovered this signal and he could hear American voices. And so he notified the US embassy or actually the ambassador's home and they then found the device. This technology 75 years ago was something that we didn't understand. We really did not know how it worked. But the, and uh, it took the US a while just to figure out how this technology functioned. But the amazing thing about it is that it was a remote controlled bugging device and it didn't require any power and it was very, very effective. So let's jump forward to only 20 years ago. So this is 1999, 20 years ago. And again, the Russians uh, bugged uh, a State Department office. This device was an electronic device. It was hidden in the chair rail of a conference room. To this day, we have no idea how this device was actually installed. But it was an electronic device. It was powered by the building wiring. And uh, there was the way they activated it was a, a, a person would be outside of the building. He could send a signal to, to the bug turn it on and listen. And the way they found this device was not actually doing a TSCM. It wasn't by electronic methods. It's just that they noticed a Russian that was always outside during important meetings. And, uh, and they realized that he was always listening to something during the meetings. And they became suspicious. And because of the suspicion, they found the device. So this type of technology 20 years ago was considered very high government level, was not available to anyone else except government type operations. And the point I wanna make is technology much, much better than this is now available to everyone. It's available on Amazon and eBay and anyone can buy it. And this is one of the reasons for espionage and surveillance threats increasing. This is part of the problem. As a company, we always divided surveillance threat into these four categories. On the left side, you have consumer electronics, baby monitors, cordless phones, these types of devices that could easy, easily be modified into a bugging device. Then you had spy shop type equipment. This was cheap equipment, uh, not good quality, but uh, commercially available. On the right-hand side, in the top right, we have law enforcement grade, this is uh, much more sophisticated devices. And then the bottom right would be the most sophisticated technology, typically reserved for federal government agencies. The problem is that these categories on the left-hand side, the technology has now become equal to, or in many cases better, than what's available to professional uh, law enforcement and government services. So I wanna show you some examples just to give you an idea how the technology has changed. Uh, in the past, traditional surveillance relied on transmitters and, uh, and telephone wiring networks, but today, modern eavesdropping relies on Wi-Fi, cellular networks, commercially available networks that are very sophisticated and very secure. One point I wanna to make too about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is certainly vital uh, we know that uh, IT network to prevent hacking, cybersecurity is all the rage. Companies, organizations, governments, law enforcement, we all spend a lot of money on this type of protection. But the point of it is when someone hacks into your network, it may be very difficult to actually find the information. The problem is the spoken word are an important meeting. They're always talking about the most important information and tactical information arriving from that type of surveillance may be much more effective than hacking into the network. So I'm not saying cybersecurity is not important. It certainly is. But what you say and what you do in meetings must also be protected. This is uh, one important point too. This is a news article. I, I, this is just from last year. And some quotes from the news article. 
the, uh, the bottom right quote says, the biggest disruptive force is technology. And this is in spying and in espionage. The other point is that the most critical element of the technology storm engulfing intelligence agencies is the mobile phone. I mean, we all carry a device that can effectively be used as a bugging device, and we have to be mindful of them in so many different ways. So the cellular phone itself is the world's greatest bug. You have to protect against how it's used. This is uh, just another comment about the mobile phones. This was a, uh, a YouTube video, or actually not a YouTube, but a video I found online, but already four smartphone spy hacks you can do right now. So it's easy. You, you, you can find on the internet how to do it easy. This is an advertisement I found on the internet uh, some time ago, and I'm not going to talk so much about the transmitter, but I circle this quote at the bottom. I, this, this quote summarizes the problem in so many different ways. I'll read it to you. It says, when it comes to surveillance, why let the government have all the fun? This tiny spy transmitter is just the thing that you need to jumpstart your recreational espionage efforts. I, I think that's hilarious, but it is the mentality now of so many people and, uh, the, and, and what's available on the internet. These are just some examples of uh, a lot of different threats, different technologies. On the left-hand side, the top right, these are more common traditional bugging devices. But as you move across this, there are many different examples and the technology increases. Some of these devices look uh, almost like a spy shop, but the reality of it is they are very sophisticated and very useful. So I'm gonna go into some of these examples just to give you some ideas. This one is uh, just a standard RF transmitter. This is from a website called Spy City. Most of these devices are Chinese or Russian made but they're commercially available now. Uh, you see devices anywhere from $200 to $600. They are very, very good quality. Um, I did like to, uh, I wanna show some of these devices here. This one is, uh, the second one over is actually a, a power line transmitter. So it's not so much an RF radiated device. It can use your power lines, it can use phone lines, it can even use ethernet to transmit information throughout your facility. This is an interesting example. Now we have uh, transmitters that are so paper thin, the battery, the microphone, the circuitry, that they hide it inside a piece of cardboard. So we have devices that are within the walls of a cardboard box that unless you x-ray it, you really can't visibly see it. Here they're showing an example of inside of a portfolio, but it has almost no dimension to it. It's only like a couple of millimeters thick. This is a GPS devices. GPS devices now are also used as surveillance threats. These are just uh, offered in different shapes and sizes. I like this interesting one that's put inside of a, of a belt. Uh, but one point is why is a GPS device considered a, a threatening surveillance device? It's because most of these devices now also carry audio. This is a perfect example of a GPS device that is advertised, ready to ship with a microphone and a GPS tracker. So you can install this on someone, on a vehicle, or in a package. At any time, you can access that audio, not only track the device, but listen to what's going on. And it's $50, very cheap. This one, this is one of my favorite devices. It looks like a uh, iPhone charger. It is only $16.59 off of eBay. This device actually has a SIM card, and it, it's more or less all the transmitter electronics that you would have in a normal GSM-type phone systems. So from this device, if it's plugged into the wall, I can call it through the cellular network. I can turn on the audio. I can listen to the audio and bug this room in a very, very effective manner. And the amazing thing is, a normal iPhone charger in the U.S. costs $30. This is half the price, and it still charges your iPhone perfectly. So. This one is even more amazing. It is a bugging device with a microphone built into it. It, uh, it actually tracks. It's not truly GPS, 
but inside a car, it will use the cellular network to get uh, a lo uh, tracking location on it. But the amazing thing is that just in this plug, the USB plug, a SIM card fits inside it. So you can buy this off the internet, off eBay for $10. For 10, then you, you have to go to another store, buy the SIM card and install it. But if this is in a car, you can call this device from anywhere in the world, turn on the audio and listen to it. And you can also uh, download the, the information, location information as to where the device is. This is a website called uh, emporium.com. I circled the headline here because this is called, it says the shop that creates spies. Most of these devices that it's showing are Russian made. This company Edict is uh, very popular in Russia for making not only transmitters, RF transmitters, but audio recorders as well. This is just a quick search of some YouTube videos uh, regarding, regarding video surveillance. The top left one is how to locate hidden cameras in a hotel rooms and vacation rentals. This other one is investigation discovers some hotel rooms have hidden cameras installed. The other videos on the right are just showing uh, th this is how to spot hidden cameras, top 10 spy cameras and spy gadgets. It's, it's running rampant. Spy cameras are so cheap, so easy and easy, easy to install, easy to acquire. This one is actually one of my favorite ones. This is a Wi-Fi IP camera. Uh, this, this section here, this is the camera and actually the, the electronics. This large shape here is actually the battery. This is available on eBay for only $19. What's amazing about this device is that if I install it in a facility as a surveillance camera, I do need some Wi-Fi to, to get the information out. And most IT security people say, oh, well, you won't, use, you won't get into my Wi-Fi network. It's locked down. I know all the IP addresses on that network. But this doesn't have to be on a secure network. If the facility has a guest network, you can use the guest network. It really doesn't matter what the network is. If there is no network available, you can still program it to use an ad hoc type network. In an ad hoc type network, once the camera is installed, someone just pulls up in a car or in the parking lot, accesses the device through Wi-Fi, downloads audio, downloads video, listens in real time, whatever they want to do. The reason I like to point out this device is earlier I showed a slide from 20 years ago, the Russian device that was inside the State Department. The point I want to make is this device is much, much better and more effective than the one that was found by the Russians 20 years ago. Because this doesn't have to have a person listening outside. It's not only audio, it's audio and video. And it, if you run it off a uh, building power, just like the other one, it will last forever. And it's much smaller, much harder to find. One other thing too is the Russian one 20 years ago had to be on a unique transmit frequency. So it, it it was easy to find because of the RF transmission. This is Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi signal hides within all the other Wi-Fi traffic. So it's very difficult to locate. These are just some other common devices. Now we have to worry about everything in the world having Wi-Fi. Uh, the ones on the left are Blink and Ring cameras, but all of these other devices have the ability to transmit anywhere else in the world, easily modified to be bugging devices. So what is TSCM? Now maybe you have a better understanding. TSCM is the protection against information loss and theft. It's finding hidden, illegal, uh, nefarious bugging devices. We consider it a component of a physical security. Because not only do you have to secure all of the environment, you have to secure any sort of electronic devices that may be placed in that same environment. What's being protected? Well, on the government side, it can be national security, military secrets, investigations, uh, sensitive political information, scandals, VIP protection. And on the commercial side, it's actually just as broad. 
marketing strategies, new products, uh, IP, labor union disputes, trade secrets, legal battles, any information that has value, this is what we're trying to protect. So there's a, diff there's a lot of different ways to try to defend against it, and I'll, I'm just going to talk in general terms. The first approach is countermeasures. Countermeasures maybe include shielded rooms, may include audio masking, may include RF jammers, ultrasonic masking. These are all countermeasures that don't necessarily tell you if there's a bugging device, but it does help to prevent against it. But if you want to find a bugging device, there's a lot of different technology that you may need. You may need to uh, do physical searches with thermal cameras, normal cameras. You have to look for transmitter detection to detect RF transmitters. You have to check your telephones. You have to check your cell phones. You have to check all of your Wi-Fi traffic to make sure there's no bugging devices. Um, it's, it's not an easy job. And there, there's a broad range of technologies that you really need to secure all of your facilities and all the possibilities. We always say that uh, counter surveillance or TSCM is a little bit like the problem of terrorism. You know, the terrorist only has to be right once. But the person defending against it, the counter-terrorist, has to be right all the time. It's the same in TSCM. The spy has a million ways to steal the information. And the TSCM specialist, the sweep specialist, has to find all of them if he can. Anyway, that concludes my presentation. Our main agent here is Burkana, and uh, they represent all of the technologies on that previous slide. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Tom, thank you very much. I'm a little bit more afraid now with all this, <laughs> these spies, but uh, thank you very much for, for your speech. Thank you. Uh, bom, é, bom, pessoal, agradeço né, mais uma vez a atenção de todos vocês. Nós vamos aqui, nós já estamos já no, no encerramento do nosso painel. Mas ainda dá tempo da gente conversar aqui e fazer uma pergunta para cada um dos nossos participantes. E eu queria começar com o nosso amigo é, é, o Gilá, da, da NSO, para falar sobre a questão dos principais desafios. Quais os principais desafios é, para que os clientes efetivamente comprem, né, que adquiram essa solução anti-drone? Existe um desafio grande nisso? Thank you. Um, I think uh, the two main concerns that customers have when we start a project or when they think about counter drone is one that they don't know what's going on. Mm. Maybe they saw a drone, maybe two, maybe they heard from a parallel organization, but they don't know the numbers and so on. So they need to get more concrete information and more security in what are the types of threats they are actually facing. The second and most important thing, or even more important thing, is that uh, most of them, most of us work in an urban environment that is dense, and even if it's not dense in buildings, it's dense in RF communications, and the entire challenge of bringing something that might interfere with their operations might use weapons, or if they eliminate the use of weapons, might interfere with communications, uh, makes it a very long and frustrating challenge to understand how to minimize all the risks that are concerned. So first of all, we always uh, try to present these questions to them to help them overcome the challenges and minimize the risks uh, in adopting counter drone uh, solutions. Thank you. É, bom, para o nosso amigo é, Edson, eu... Edson, você até comentou a questão já da... de que nós temos diferentes tipo, padrões diferentes de rádio, né? Você até comentou que é possível essa integração. Mas esse é um grande desafio. Há tecnologia hoje, efetivamente. Eu queria que você falasse um pouquinho mais sobre essa questão né, da integração dos diferentes padrões de rádio. 
É, é verdade, é um desafio grande no Brasil maior, eu acho, uhum. porque o Brasil ele não Cada seguiu um... uma tecnologia é. só, né? a gente pega na Europa, se seguiu um padrão, nos Estados Unidos outro, mas aqui sim é possível, uh, e na verdade a gente tem já implantado, inclusive no Brasil em alguns clientes, uh, uhum. esse, esse tipo de tecnologia para que do ponto de vista do usuário que está em campo, seja completamente transparente. Se ele está usando uma rede P25, uma rede Tetra, se ele está utilizando uma, uma aplicação em cima de, broad, de banda larga, de broadband. E, e vai ser completamente transparente. E tem, inclusive, diferentes formas de fazer essa integração. Tá? É, e, e, e aí, pensando nessas fontes, não só essas tecnologias podem ser integradas. Eu posso é, fazer parte dessa integração de áudio, inclusive o telefone fixo de um, de uma, da mesa de, um, de, um, de uma pessoa lá de gestão de um centro de comando e controle. Então, sim, e já existem realmente. A, atualmente, a gente já tem vários clientes que já partiram para essa integração. Às vezes, não porque ele tem várias tecnologias, mas porque ele, como agência A, precisa falar com a agência B. Então, e dentro de operações táticas, isso é muito comum. E, e também ele já tem isso pronto, inclusive, para esse tipo de integração. Com, uh, sabendo que outros, uh, outras agências têm tecnologias diferentes, ele já está preparado para isso. Então, às vezes, dentro do mesmo estado, né, você tem órgãos com tecnologia diferente. Né, do... Brasil, eu acho que é o pior deles. Tá? Aqui, esse pedacinho aqui, o plano piloto, é extremamente importante. É. E a gente vê redes e redes diferentes aqui. E sim, é, é, realmente, a necessidade de integração é, é enorme. E, realmente, a gente já consegue fazer isso de uma forma extremamente eficiente. Tá? Legal. É, Tom, é, quais os principais desafios é, no desenvolvimento, treinamento e aperfeiçoamento das equipes na busca dessas ameaças ilegais? Thank you very much. It's a really good question. Um, Just a comment about uh, the market and levels. There are government levels, law enforcement levels, and commercial levels. The first step, really, that's the most important step, is just awareness. It's understanding the threat. This is why I chose this type of presentation today, just to make people aware. Uh, we have equipment in over 100 countries at government, law enforcement, and commercial levels. I'm always amazed at organizations at all of those levels that are naive or, or want to ignore this type of threat. But the ones that do uh, at the federal government levels, it's a significant amount of money and training because they have a significant level of threat that they have to be concerned about. Um, and usually you have teams at that level of five to 10, 15 people that may have a, a year of training to, to really do the proper job. But on the other end of the spectrum, on the commercial spectrum, often you have a, a company that has some things that, to protect, and they'll start off with uh, some small pieces of equipment. They'll learn to use that equipment, and every year they grow. So I never say it's a black and white, but it's a gradual process. You can, you can learn to find the more simple threats fairly quickly, but uh, to be sophisticated at the government level It's a broad, big task with uh, a lot of different technologies that you must understand. Okay. So, I hope that answers the question. Sure, sure, sure. Very good. Bem, meus amigos, nós já estamos encerrando aqui mais este painel. Eu gostaria de pedir para que né, cada um agradecer a presença de todos vocês, né, agradecer ao, o apoio ao nosso simpósio. Sem vocês é, não seria possível estarmos aqui hoje, né, por, por confiar, né, é, no nosso trabalho e gostaria de passar para que cada um fizesse suas considerações finais e seus agradecimentos. Tom, por gentileza. Yes, you can start. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I wanted to compliment you on the organization and the opportunity. Um, I have to confess, I mean, normally my company does more than 20 international exhibitions per year. This is the first one that we've done since COVID. Oh, and I wanted to thank you for uh, being brave enough and addressing all mm -hmm. of the issues. I think it's, it, to me, and I was talking about this just last week, I believe the world is watching and yes. how you conduct this exhibition. Okay. And thank you for that, because it's time that we all get back to some normalcy to yes. continue protecting our countries. Thank, thank, you, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Edson? Eu também gostaria de agradecer bastante a oportunidade.